Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's indeed a privilege and an honor to be uh, the first speaker in your TEDx that you're just uh, inaugurated right, right now. So the idea I want to talk about today is that, uh, is the world we live in, is it a safer place today than in the past? And because we are in talking about back to basics, I thought this would be a relevant topic for today. So to start with, you have to go back, probably I take you back 50,000 years back when man was threatened by different kind of animals, the nature. And we had the stone age, you had the stone tools where man started defending themselves. I take you forward and fast forward to 2500 years BC where um, with the advent of the uh, Bronze Age and the Iron Age, the weapons that man made uh, to defend themselves started to get a little more sophisticated. And again, if you go 500 years further, we find that science came in and with the invention of wheel, that's the famous Harpen toy cart, uh, where man started getting um, mobile. Now let's go a little ahead and come to 1300 years, uh, 1380. That's when the gunpowder was discovered in China and the cannon was invented. There were firearms invented for the next 300 years coming to even personal weapons like the pistol and so forth. Another 300 years when we had uh, the uh, industrial revolution, we had a number of different machines being developed. What I've shown is the famous German U-boat and number of warships were developed during that time. So we are now at 1980. Now let's talk about the last 100 years. Among the last 100 years, you'd find that the first 50 of them, we've been mostly being busy uh, fighting the world wars and fighting wars basically. And that's the time where technology developed and there were a number of new kind of machines, the first aircraft carrier, the first famous Messerschmitt from Germany, the first jet aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, then we had the first tank and so forth. And the next 50 years, I'm talking on 1950s onwards, uh, next 50 or 60 years, we had different uh, paradigm shift in warfare where we had chemical, biological, nuclear, space, and today we have cyber warfare going on. So there's a, a complete paradigm shift. And so what do we do? So somewhere around 2002 is when in my lab in DRDO, we started developing unmanned vehicles or robots to counter the, such kind of threat. So this was the first robot to be made and that was called the uh, remotely operated vehicle Dux or Dux Primal. But this is a, a, a ROV which can be controlled from 500 meters uh, over a radio frequency or also with a fiber optic link. It's, got, it's battery operated, goes on for three hours. It's meant primarily to handle improvised explosive devices or IEDs as we know it today. So if there's a bag or a baggage found in, a, in any place and you want to Located, your, um, uh, you want to move it from um, the crowded area, maybe a bus station, and you take it out, you use this robot, you take it out, and after that it has got an X-ray device, you can scan it, and there are armaments on which, uh, using which you can diffuse it. So this uh, was our first uh, uh, effort way back in 2002, and uh, these are some of the slides I wanted to show you of how this equipment can be used in the field when we were called by the Army to for trials. So this you see the, uh, the uh, robot um, going over the railway track, some of the night trials, then going through um, in, in uh, these highways, under the uh, culverts you'll find the uh, rogue elements, they put these IEDs underneath these bridges. And that's where we were asked to take out one of these simulated IEDs of course. And this was weighing about 8 kg and you can see water flowing and, and uh, um, you can see uh, the whole wheels are caked with mud and so forth. Then we were asked to remove a pressure cooker IED. That's very, very common. So this was again in, the, in a pit next to the road covered with boulders and it was raining and we had to remove it. At that time our, our robot didn't have rubber, rubber gloves or rubber fingers. So we, were, we had an aluminum to aluminum contact. We were very apprehensive whether it's going to be able to catch it or it could slip. But lucky for us it could come out. And of course today we have given it uh, a rubber coating. Then we went back, um, we came back from the first trial and we came back with a number of observations. One of them was mobility. And if you can see this kind of terrain, uh, it's very difficult to operate in such kind of terrain. So we came back uh, to our lab and we started uh, looking for uh, a different kind of wheel. So where do you look for a wheel? So obviously we went to the scooter stand and we looked for the Bajaj wheel, we looked at the kinetic wheel and nothing was actually fitting. 
So some of us, uh, we sat together and said, where will we get the wheel? So someone came up with this idea that let's go to the airport. Because in the airport, there are a number of different type of vehicles with weird type of wheels. So we rushed to the airport and we asked the maintenance guy, that where do you get your wheels from? So he said, oh, the, there's a dealer just about 15 kilometers away. And he gave us the address, so we went there. And there we uh, went to a tire shop, basically. And he asked, uh, he asked me which, uh, I said I wanted tires. He asked me which vehicle. So I said, um, I can't tell you which vehicle, because there was no mobile phone there those days. So how do I show him? So luckily, one of us had you know, a, a, a printout, and we showed it to him, and this kind of a robot. So he said, OK, you're coming from the government. I said, yeah, uh, I want six wheels. So he says, I don't send to government. <laughs> so I was shocked. I said, uh, come on, I mean, government doesn't go back on payment. I'll give you your money. So he says, no, I deal in cash. You give me cash, I give you the wheel, and so forth. So it was a very tough time. And then I said, OK, you at least let me have a look at your go-down. So we went to, he was very apprehensive. He said, somebody from the government wants to look at his go-down, and he deals in cash. So anyway. So he allowed us in, and we were very thrilled to see his go down there. There were wheels like bigger than me, and the huge wheels, and smaller wheel tracks, and so forth. So we picked up four wheels, or six wheels, and came to his, on his table, and we said, we want these six wheels. So he says, cash. So I said, uh, you keep my watch. So uh, what to do? I mean, how to convince him? And so then he saw the, probably the sincerity. And then, of course, now we are close friends. But I tell you, the first experience to get the basic ingredients of the components was so difficult. So uh, this is how you see it, 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 it can tow a small truck as well as it carries out x-ray and so forth. So this equipment has uh, gone into production and it is with the army being used for the last three years. So then um, this, um, around the year 2008, uh, we started developing the UAV Netra along with a company called Idea Forge. They were passed out students like you who had just passed out of IIT Bombay and they approached me. And uh, we together developed this for three years. And what came out was Netra. And uh, yeah, so Netra is uh, what comes in a small suitcase. And you can take it anywhere you want. And you click off a button, you can let it fly, I mean, take off. It is completely autonomous. So you don't have to fly it like a remote controlled plane. Uh, it's got the onboard uh, autopilot board, which does all the stabilization as it goes. Goes to that point where you want it to go. It hovers there, gives you a live video, um, uh, and it's fitted with a day camera with 10x zoom. Alternately, you can put a uh, thermal imager. And uh, with the thermal imager, the pitch darkness you can see um, and keep a track of what's happening down. So this is being used by the paramilitary forces primarily. Um, in uh, for counterinsurgency operation, it's being used by the police and so forth. So I now go to the little forward from Netra, and around 2010 there was a different kind of threat. This threat was that you may find bombs not only with explosives but with other kind of contaminants in the form of radiation, radioactive material, chemicals, or biological uh, warfare elements. So we developed this uh, what we call duck spotter and. This has got a suit of four sensors. It's got a chemical sensor, it's got a biosensor, it's got an explosive detector and a radiation sensor, primarily for the NDRF. So they can be prepared in case there's a call of duty anywhere that there is such kind of an element found and you don't know what's in that bag or in that suitcase. And you can send this robot, it's got all these sensors. It's got an arm which can extend 2.5 meters, it can pick up 20 kgs, bring it out, uh, relocated into a safer container and render it safe, basically. So, um, going along the way around uh, four years back, we realized that the platform we had made is too big, it doesn't go into confined spaces. So we started making uh, this robot and today it's just undergoing trials right now. This we have called Dutch Mini, which can get into an aircraft or a railway platform. It can stretch and lift, uh, go up to two meters high, open the cabin baggage space, go into a three-tire uh, uh, three berth and take out any suspected bag if it, is, uh, if it has been kept by someone. Because today no one wants to touch it. If there's a bag lying and it's an unclaimed bag, it's a very risky proposition to go and have a, uh, to uh, try to lift it and take it manually. So we, we developed this robot and this is currently going through the trials. And you can see how it can go through the uh, uh, aircraft aisle as well as into a train, uh, reach up, 
and take out up to 10 kgs. Uh, that's the limit. In addition, there's a water gun or a water jet disruptor that is fitted on this. So in situ, I mean in that place, if you want to diffuse it, you can use that water gun to diffuse uh, um, the IED or the uh, suspected bomb. So um, thereafter, we went and uh, went on uh, uh, developing different kind of robots, and this is one of them, which is for uh, surveillance purpose. We developed this for um, basically uh, be a man-packed robot, which can be carried. It weighs 12 kilos, and it's got a small tab using which, or an iPhone, I mean a phone, using which you can. You can control it. It's got four cameras, and uh, what it has is just four cameras which give the day and night capability. It can climb stairs, go inside a building, stand where you want it to stand, and give you live video of what's happening inside. The range is 200 meters. So this uh, particular robot is also currently undergoing trials, and uh, very soon it will be with the with the security forces. Uh, additionally, this robot also we have given a facility to put a water gun or a water jet disruptor. So that in case of a bag is found and you're pretty sure that uh, you don't want to touch it, you basically want to open it out, you can use this robot to go and remotely do that. Around 2014, the, uh, we also started developing the first weaponized robot, and this was what we called as the Dutch Warrior. And this is under development, not ready as yet. This has got a light machine gun and a grenade launcher, and it can be remotely controlled. It's got a sighting system for day and night vision, which is bore sighted with the gun, so that the operator can uh, use it. It can go into any kind of terrain. Why do you endanger the soldier? Uh, so you send this machine. It can be repaired. It can be you know uh, written off in case it gets shot. So this is these are some of the slides of uh, the Dutch in operation. These was uh, from one of the places where an IED was found. It has come down from the ramp. There is a specially designed vehicle with the ducts. It's come down, and there you see it's somewhere there. And uh, after you approach the object, the duct goes closer. You go closer, you see something in red, and probably that is something uh, which is look, needs some attention. So what is done is you fire the water jet gun and water gun, and you blast it open. You open it out. And then uh, what you see here is there are some wires, there's a mobile phone, you're pretty sure it's going to be something, it may be an IED. And then uh, it's pulled out, and then someone with a bomb suit approaches, has a closer look at it, and after, you, the, after that you take a trained dog, and basically when the dog sits down, it confirms there's explosive inside, and when you open it, this is what you find uh, inside that. And after that, of course, the security force are looking into the mobile and trying to trace who the person is. So I just wanted to share this idea and to tell you that uh, although it's been years since when we started 50,000 years back, the threat has always been there to the human species and uh, the only thing that the threat has been changing. Tomorrow we don't expect a conventional war of sorts, but these non-state players, asymmetric warfare is what is going to stay with us. And unmanned vehicle or robots are definitely the future of warfare. Although we have been threatened, I'm sure we must be prepared for it. The animal, what we are looking at tomorrow, is of a different kind, but we must be prepared. Thank you.